They shouted coward at you this afternoon. But why do you think you and Trump have no appeal to the young? Well, I don't think, uh, you know, I disagree why that. And why? the evidence is... British politicians are rarely given an easy ride by the media. And that's for good reason. But for Jeremy Corbyn, the ride has been particularly rough. So your future as Labour leader is absolutely intact. You're not considered for a moment whether Look, you as leader are damaging the party's chance. I'm really surprised chance. the BBC is reporting fake news. In 2015, Corbyn was elected leader of Britain's opposition party, the Labour Party. And in the three years since, much of the British news coverage has often ridiculed, caricatured and demonised him and his policies. Here's the thing about the media representations or misrepresentations of Jeremy Corbyn, is that they're not particularly consistent. So, one minute he's a dangerous terrorist sympathiser. On the other hand, he's portrayed as ineffectual, as a pacifist, a, you know, vegetarian leaf eater. Our media, in many cases, is failing. Now, this isn't just the view of someone who has had, shall we say, an interesting relationship with the media, particularly over the last three years. A few months back, Corbyn was invited to speak at one of the British media's key industry events, the Edinburgh Television Festival. And he used that platform to launch his vision for the future of journalism. On the national public broadcaster, the BBC, Corbyn had a few ideas on how it's funded and how it should be governed. Currently, the broadcaster's board members are appointed in part by the government and the rest selected by BBC senior management. Corbyn wants to make this more democratic. He said that the public, whose taxes pay for the broadcaster, as well as BBC employees, should be the ones who choose the board. He has this view that to depoliticise the BBC, it would be a good idea to have some form of elected officials at the top of the organisation. It's one of those things that seems like a very nice idea in, in theory, but if you create a, a system whereby some sort of non-executive board are elected, the next step to having elections is to turn them into sort of a plaything for political parties. And when it comes to diversity, Corbyn called for full transparency about who works at the broadcaster, not just in terms of ethnicity, but in terms of class too. So here's the thing about England. Only 7% of UK school children go to private schools, and yet if you have this private school background, you are more likely to get top jobs in the media. Look at the Grenfell tragedy that happened in 2017. Residents of Grenfell have been trying to reach out to media saying, look, we are being left in unsafe accommodation and we're worried that it's going to take a tragedy, a fatal tragedy, to get people to listen. These are the people who are shut out of newsrooms and they're also the same people who might be plugged into stories into communities that more privileged people just can't reach that's a grave failing of the media establishment corbyn's rise to prominence comes as a surprise to many but his appeal a left-leaning socialist politics of yester century resonates when it comes to current debates on the rise of unregulated tech giants the public realm doesn't have to sit back and watch as a few megatech corporations hoovered up digital rights, assets, and ultimately our money. The UK media, its broadcasters and its newspapers, are suffering as big tech sucks the life and money out of them. So, like many others, Corbyn is calling for them to be reined in, taxed more. But he's gone further. He says the proceeds from that tax should fund public broadcasting, as well as cash-strapped investigative journalism and local media. The British media is dominated by a handful of powerful conglomerates. Just three companies control 71% of the national newspaper market. Top of that list is Rupert Murdoch's News UK, housed in the building right behind me. News UK owns The Sun, Britain's biggest selling paper, as well as The Sun on Sunday, The Times and The Sunday Times. It also used to own the news of the world, but that paper was shut down after revelations that journalists there had been hacking the phone of murdered schoolgirl Millie Dowler. That scandal led to a two-part Leveson inquiry. The first part called for a state-backed press regulator that all newspapers would have to sign up to or face the consequences. 
the Conservative government rejected it. The second part would have got at the relationship between newspapers and the police. In March of this year, the government abandoned it. Corbyn wants to recall Leveson, to hold the media to account for past crimes and to push for future regulation. A study produced by the Media Reform Coalition took a close look at some 250 articles and broadcast news clips covering the anti-Semitism story. More than 90 of them were found to be either misleading or inaccurate. What we have seen across the national press and largely echoed in broadcasters is something that I think is truly unprecedented. And that's not so much in the kind of critical stance that they have taken towards Corbyn and the policy platforms that he represents, but just in what we know from the research that we've produced, has been a systematic subversion of basic journalistic news values. When Jeremy Corbyn ran to become Labour's leader, he triggered the biggest party membership surge in British history. Media across the country hadn't seen him coming. They discounted him, dismissed him. And three years in, the media are still grappling with how to deal with him and the revival of the socialist politics that he has inspired. A politics which, for Corbyn, must involve a radical overhaul, a structural reform of the media itself. I have never seen in my lifetime or in modern political history uh, any presidential candidate trying to discredit the elections and the election process before votes have even taken place. Have we ever tried to meddle in other countries' elections? Oh, probably, but uh, it was for the good of the system in order to avoid the uh, communists from taking yeah. over. For example, in Europe, uh, uh, in 47, 48, 49, uh, the Greeks and the Italians, we... We don't do CIA. that now, though. We don't mess around other people's well, elections, yeah. And really the goal here was simple, damage Hillary Clinton and elect Donald Trump. And these Russians allegedly went to great lengths. I think that the president has uh, continued to abdicate responsibility here about leading the country in response to an attack on the most core fundamental part of our democracy, our free and fair elections. The Russians spent about $100,000 on Facebook ads. That compares to $81 million that the Clinton and Trump campaign spent on Facebook ads. It's now obvious that the Russians were trying to interfere in our election. This is getting closer and closer and closer to the Trump inner circle. The big stuff is probably yet to come. And it, indeed, it does seem as though Mueller is just beginning to lay the groundwork. But stay tuned for more. We are looking at the possibility that the president of the United States and those around him during an election campaign colluded with a hostile foreign power to undermine the basis of our democracy. Donald Trump is afraid. A political hurricane is out there at sea for him. We'll call it Hurricane Vladimir, if you will, the whole <laughs> Russian thing. This is evidence of willingness to commit collusion. That says, what has the DOJ and the FBI done to bring these people to investigate them or to bring charges against them? We want to know what's going on here. And then if you go to the special counsel and you see the expansive nature of this special counsel, and you now hear Adam Schiff is saying himself that, you know, basically he's saying there's no real evidence of collusion. It's all out there. Has been no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russians or Trump and Russians. No collusion. Now, the only concrete evidence of collusion with Russia that we have is Hillary Clinton and her bought and paid for dossier that's filled with Russian lies, Russian government lies, and propaganda and salacious details that were never verified. The opposition research file that Hillary and the DNC paid more than $12 million for, one file was used to illegally obtain a surveillance warrant against an American national during a presidential campaign. James Comey, Andrew McCabe, Rod Rosenstein, and Sally Yates, they signed off on the documents, verifying their truth and authenticity. It appears that that was all a lie, and that's six different felonies. Either the Obama administration was not prepared for Russia trying to interfere our election, or his administration made a choice to ignore the threat, probably the latter, probably because they thought Hillary was going to win. It's that simple. Finally, we're getting to find who's behind the curtain, 
and it's going to the very, very top of the last administration. We've been talking about FISA gate or Memo gate. We will probably end up talking about Obama gate. Look at the facts already. I mean, John Brennan, just, just Google who this person is. John Brennan, in 1976, voted for Gus Hall, the Communist Party candidate for American president, and then he joins the CIA four years later, and then Obama eventually makes him director of the CIA, a man who voted for the Communist Party to take over America. Obama basically turned loose the sycophants in the intelligence community and others, really to uh, conduct all this fraudulent crap around, around, uh, around the election to try, to try to not have Trump be elected. And of course, it continues to this day. You're going to find out about the media someday, folks. They are the worst. They are the worst. I think the idea that one person, who in this case happens to be a right-wing billionaire, uh, can have that much influence in media is very dangerous for our democracy. And by the way, of course, in terms of Murdoch, he owns a lot of media in Australia, in the United Kingdom. I believe he owns media in Eastern Europe. I think this is a pretty dangerous trick. The mainstream media in the West, and especially in Germany, um, has just become so incredibly complacent and corrupt and, uh, you know, just off base and out of touch. And they're in for a rude awakening, and it's already happening. This is like a citizen rebellion. I mean, we're a global movement of people from all over the world have just had it up to here with the lies and the nonsense in the mainstream media. What makes you very different is that you're crowdfunding, so it's people paying for what they read. That's right. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, we really are in a way almost like a political movement.